We're going to be in Lamentations chapter 2. So we have Bibles here. If you're using one that we have on site, we're going to be on page um, 706. Those are the blue Bibles that you can find in the chair in the book rack in front of you. We're on page 706. Um, we're in Lamentations chapter 2. It is a, it's lament, which is uh, to express uh, frustration, difficulty, protest, um, even shades of anger and, and bitterness. And uh, this is a rough book. Somebody's like, man, what are we doing? Uh, middle of summer, going through Lamentations together. But I, I hope that this proves helpful. We're going to be in Lamentations chapter 2. There's 22 verses. It, it's a little bit longer, but I'll read it. And then we'll pray and we'll get to work. Lamentations chapter 2, starting in verse 1. How the Lord has covered daughter Zion with the cloud of his anger. He's hurled down the splendor of Israel from heaven to earth. He's not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. Without pity, the Lord has swallowed up all the dwellings of Jacob. In his wrath, he has torn down the strongholds of daughter Judah. He's brought her kingdom and its princes down to the ground in dishonor. In fierce anger, he has cut off every horn of Israel. He has withdrawn his right hand at the approach of the enemy. He has burned in Jacob like a flaming fire that consumes everything around it. Like an enemy, he has strung his bow. His right hand is ready. Like a foe, he has slain all who were pleasing to the eye. He has poured out his wrath like fire on the tent of daughter Zion. The Lord is like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces and destroyed her strongholds. He has multiplied mourning and lamentation for daughter Judah. He has laid waste his dwelling like a garden. He has destroyed his place of meeting. The Lord has made Zion forget her appointed festivals and her Sabbaths. In his fierce anger, he has spurned both king and priest. The Lord has rejected his altar and abandoned his sanctuary. He has given the walls of her palaces into the hands of the enemy. They've raised a shout in the house of the Lord, as on the day of an appointed festival. The Lord determined to tear down the wall around daughter Zion. He stretched out a measuring line and did not withhold his hand from destroying. He made ramparts and walls lament. Together they wasted away. Her gates have sunk into the ground. Their bars he has broken and destroyed. Her king and her princes are exiled among the nations. The law is no more, and her prophets no longer find visions from the Lord. The elders of daughter Zion sit on the ground in silence. They have sprinkled dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. My eyes have failed from weeping. I'm in torment within. My heart is poured out on the ground because my people are destroyed, because children and infants faint in the streets of the city. They say to their mothers, where is bread and wine? As they faint like the wounded in the streets of the city, as their lives ebb away in their mother's arms. What can I say for you? With what can I compare you? daughter Jerusalem. To what can I liken you that I may comfort you, virgin daughter Zion? Your wound is as deep as the sea. Who can heal you? The visions of your prophets were false and worthless. They did not expose your sin to ward off your captivity. The prophecies they gave you were false and misleading. All who pass your way clap their hands at you. They scoff and shake their heads at daughter Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? All your enemies open their mouths wide against you. They scoff and gnash their teeth and say, we have swallowed her up. This is the day we've waited for. We have lived to see it. The Lord has done what he planned. He has fulfilled his word, which he decreed long ago. He has overthrown you without pity. He has let the enemy gloat over you. He has exalted the horn of your foes. The hearts of the people cry out to the Lord. You, walls of daughter Zion, let your tears flow like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief, your eyes no rest. Arise, 
Cry out in the night as the watches of the night begin. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint from hunger at every street corner. Look, Lord, and consider. Whom have you ever treated like this? Should women eat their offspring, the children they have cared for? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? Young and old lie together in the dust of the streets. My young men and young women have fallen by the sword. You have slain them in the day of your anger. You have slaughtered them without pity. As you summon to a feast day, so you summoned against me terrors on every side. In the day of the Lord's anger, no one escaped or survived. Those I cared for and reared, my enemy has destroyed. Let's pray. Lord, as we've opened up your word together, we're praying that by your spirit, through your word, you would speak to us. We believe that all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for us, Lord. So we're looking in this moment for the benefit that this can give us as the people of God. And we confess the difficulty of this genre of literature, the difficulty of lamentations, the, the pain that this even provokes as we study it together. But Lord, would you give us eyes of faith to see your goodness through and through, to recognize the brokenness in this world and the fact that you are making all things new. And we look forward to that day, and we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll organize this under three different headings. We're going to see destruction, agony, and lament. And really, it goes from different voices of a description of what happened, the destruction, to the personal agony of the prophet Jeremiah and his own wrestling with God over the things that he has found, and then finally a call to lament, to, for the city itself to process the grief that it has been through and to turn to God in faith and in hope. So destruction we find in verses 1 to 10. Um, there's an individual named Francis Schaeffer, and I'm not sure if, if we're aware of him or not. He's actually from about a, a generation ago. He died in 1984, but a lot of the ministries, even ministries that we would look to and some of the ministries that we support, have been profoundly influenced by Francis and Edith, Edith Schaefer and their ministry called the Labrie Fellowship. And uh, for instance, the gospel, uh, gospel culture is an idea that I think kind of goes back to Francis Schaefer. Um, but in the 60s, he wrote a book called Death in the City. And so in the, in the 1960s, he was looking at uh, the political upheaval that was going on, kind of the social unrest that was happening around him, um, he, was, he was kind of processing all of this, and, and as a spiritual leader, he's trying to help people navigate this, and he wrote this book called Death in the City, and what he was saying there was, if we are not careful to be attentive to God, if we do not, as the people of God, turn to him, to, to God himself, we invite the judgment of God, and it was a prophetic warning, and he was dealing with kind of the culture of that day, and it's interesting to read it even you know, what is, what is that, 60 years later? And to, to hear some of the warnings that he was making back then and how it came true. But he was recognizing, and, and a lot of his book was based off of the ministry of Jeremiah, and he was recognizing that in the, the letter Jeremiah, the book Jeremiah, Jeremiah is warning the people, return to the Lord, or it will go very badly. And so there will be death in the city. But what we find here in Lamentations, which is the aftermath, it's not just that there is death in the city. Here we find that the city has died. And the lament is over the agony of what has occurred there. So here we find this city. And in verses 1 to 10, what we're getting really is a theological autopsy. As Jeremiah looks at what happened to the people of God and he describes what, what transpired there, he's really giving us an autopsy of, of the city of God. Let's look at it here. The first thing to note is that this is the Lord's doing. Verse 1, how the Lord has covered daughter Zion with the cloud of his anger. He's hurled down the splendor of Israel from heaven to earth. He's not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. This is a work of the, the Lord, and we're told here that this is on account of the anger of God. This is the day of his anger. If you cruise through all of these verses here, you'll notice over and over again the subject is God. It is the Lord that's covered 
daughter Zion. It's the Lord that swallowed up. He is the one who's cut off. He is the one who um, has strung his bow. So the Lord is acting here, and he's dealing with his people without mercy. Verse 2, without pity, the Lord has swallowed up all the dwellings of Jacob. In his wrath, he has torn down the strongholds of daughter Judah. He's brought her kingdom and its her kingdom and its princes down to the ground in dishonor. This, this noble city of God has been laid desolate. And it is on account of his anger, verse 3, in his fierce anger he has cut off every horn of Israel. He has withdrawn his right hand at the approach of, it, of the enemy. He has burned in Jacob like a flaming fire that consumes everything around it. This is the work of the Lord, and he has become, the Lord has become, like an enemy. In the words of Jonathan Edwards, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God, and we see that here in verses 4 and 5. It says, like an enemy, he, God, has strung his bow. His right hand is ready. Like a foe, he has slain all who were pleasing to the eye. He's poured out his wrath like fire on the tent of daughter Zion. The Lord is like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces and destroyed her strongholds. He has multiplied mourning and lamentation for daughter Judah. Verses 1 to 5, the wrath of the Lord, the righteous anger of God is poured out on the city. What we find then is that all the different structures of societal life are now decimated. This is the reality of what happened in 587 BC when the Assyrian, no, the Babylonian army came in with Nebuchadnezzar and just leveled everything. So all of these prominent features of their society are gone. The worship structure is gone. These people have uh, existed, and they had a very important feature to them. They were the people of God, and God gave them instructions on how to to worship him appropriately. Uh, God gave them a blueprint, and it was a pattern of the temple in, in heaven itself. And so they built this massive construct, and they memorialized it, and they would go there, and they would have all these different activities that would occur within the temple construct. But now this thing is gone, and all of its activities have ceased. Verse 6, he has laid waste his dwelling like a garden. The dwelling place of God, the place where God has set his glory, is no more. He has destroyed his place of meeting. The Lord has made Zion forget her appointed festivals and her Sabbaths. All the activity that would go on there, all the sacrifices, all the beautiful things that would occur there that would remind the people of God's covenant to them are no more. Verse 7, the Lord has rejected his altar and abandoned his sanctuary. He has given the walls of her palaces into the hands of the enemy. They've raised a shout in the house of the Lord as on the day of an appointed festival. This is ironic. It's saying this place that was once filled with noise of people making a joyful noise to the Lord is now filled with the voice of the enemies rejoicing in their conquest. The house of God has been ransacked. So the worship feature of their society is decimated. Secondly, the security of the city is also compromised. The walls around them, which is a feature of their ability to police and to protect, is no more. The walls around the temple, around the city itself, have come down. Verses 8 and 9. The Lord determined to tear down the wall around daughter Zion. He stretched out a measuring line and did not withhold his hand from destroying. He made ramparts and walls lament. Together they wasted away. Her gates have sunk into the ground. Their bars he has broken and destroyed. The features of the city that would give them peace and protection are no more. The walls have been knocked over. The gates that they could open and close to protect their people have now sunken into the ground. Everything is laid waste. So the city lies in ruins. The identity of the city also has been decimated. They had a hierarchy of leadership and how things ought to operate, but everything was designed to remind them that they are people set apart to the Lord. So their leadership structures and the hierarchy of different governing officials, all of them had responsibilities to help them understand who God is and what he's like. But notice here that that is no more. Verse 6, in his fierce anger, God has spurned both king and priest. 
Look down at verse 9. Her king and her princes are exiled among the nations. The king was carried off. His eyes were plucked out. They were defeated. The king was supposed to be teaching them the things of God. You can read about that in Deuteronomy 17, where the king is supposed to take a copy of the Bible and handwrite it, his own, ver- his own personal copy of it, and read it every day. The king is supposed to be leading in this way of helping the people know what God is like and what they should do as a result of that, but, but this is no more. The king and her princes are exiled among the nations. The law is no more. And her prophets no longer find visions from the Lord. The elders of daughter Zion sit on the ground in silence. They've sprinkled dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. Every category of governing officials is being identified here as they are no longer effective in their role. They are no longer performing their task. The king and the priest, no more. The law is no more. The governing document of the people of God is no longer attended to. The priests and the sacrifices and all these things have fallen by the wayside. The identifying markers of this city are gone. They're gone. And everyone is wrecked on account of this. So a few things as we consider this theological uh, depiction of a dead city, there are a few things that we should be aware of. The first thing I want us to recognize is the anger of God is not an empty threat. There's a temptation here. And I felt it this week. I'm reading this, and I'm like, ooh, I don't, I don't like this one. What I want to do is I want to edit it. And I actually want to explain it away. And that was my, where my heart was going early on in the week in the sermon writing process. I was like, let me try to make sure that everyone's clear on this so that way we can get past the, these first 10 verses and get on to the other stuff without you know, too, too many scars or bruises here. But you'll see under the second point, I couldn't do that in good conscience. You'll see why. But the thing is, we look at God and we go, we don't like this part of his character. And so we try to edit it away. I'll show it to you. This is actually how God reveals himself in Exodus chapter 34. It's one of the most important passages on understanding God. It's where God tells us about himself. And Exodus 34 is God's own self-revelation, and so Moses is the dude here who's documenting this and gets kind of the front row seat to it, but he goes, let me see your glory, and God goes, you can't. If I showed you my unrestrained glory, it would torture you. You couldn't handle that, so I'll put you in the cleft of a rock, and I'll let my glory go by, and when it's safe, when I have passed by you, I'll remove my hand so you can see the hind quarters of my glory, and that'll be enough for you, bud. And so God does that, and he reveals his character here. This is Exodus chapter 34, and it tells, this is what God is saying. He passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation, okay? This is a very, very important passage to understand God. Now, a lot of us go, okay, there's a lot here that we like. The gracious and compassionate God, the loving God, the one who forgives sins, the one who pardons the inexcusable, the one who is abounding in love and faithfulness and maintaining his love toward us. And we underline that stuff. We go, let's, let's throw that on a coffee mug. Let's put that up in our church lobby. Let's underline the fact that this is the character of God. But then we want to edit out that next section. And we go, oh, so he's slow to anger. We're, we're, we're kind of, we're on the fence about that one. We're like, we like that it's slow, but we don't like that there's anger there. But if he's slow to anger, we'll underline the slow part. But then it tells us that he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And that's the part that we cover up. And we go, we don't like that. And then he gives us some accounting principles here. And it, it is good news. He says, thousands experience his pardon and his forgiveness and his grace. And, and a limited amount of generations experience his punishment. But listen, when God reveals his character, we have to onboard the whole thing. When God tells us what he is like, we don't get to pick and choose. Yes, he is gracious and compassionate and loving. 
He's able to forgive and pardon and treat with mercy and kindness that we do not deserve. But we also recognize he is slow to anger, but he does get angry. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. He has a righteous hatred of sin. The thing that is most destructive to us, he cannot stand it. And he is able to, in his righteousness and and totally appropriate to his character, he is able to punish sin as it deserves. So we need to be careful when we look at this passage to, to recognize that when God talks about his judgment against sin, we do not try to excuse that part of his ministry toward us. We do acknowledge that he does get angry. He's slow to anger, but there is a real legitimate anger there. And we do recognize, as, as um, Thomas Goodwin gave us this category, that his judgment is his strange work. It's not, it's not as common as his love and his compassion. It's his strange work, but it's still his work. And so he is able to judge sin. So to reject God then, just like Fran Schaefer said, to reject God is to invite death. To reject God is to onboard judgment. And so we are warned here in verses 1 to 10, the city lies wasted. Secondly, we agonize over this, verses 11 to 17. Now the prophet reveals his heart. Having seen what has occurred, having documented it and and reflected upon it, he can't help but weep over this reality. Look at verse 11. My eyes fail from weeping. I am in torment within. My heart is poured out on the ground. He's not an unfeeling prophet. He looks at this and he is devastated. The people of God lie ruined and he says, I can't stop crying. I look at what happened and I am tormented by it. I'm tormented because, verse 11, my people are destroyed because children and infants faint in the streets of the city. They say to their mothers, where's bread and wine, as they faint like the wounded in the streets of the city, as their lives ebb away in their mother's arms. He's looking on the situation, and he's wrecked by it. He's saying, even these young ones are dying in the arms of their parents there. What can I say for you? With what can I compare you, daughter Jerusalem? To what can I liken you that I may comfort you, virgin daughter Zion? Your wound is is as deep as the sea, who can heal you? He's looking at Jerusalem, and he's looking at the spiritual condition of them, and he's recognizing they are wounded in a catastrophic way. I had a ministry partner who uh, revealed this to me at one point and basically said, you know, the ministry that we were a part of, looking on all these people, and they said, as I've been praying about this, I look on this people, and what I see is a fatal wound. And what a lot of our ministry is aiming to do is so superficial, it will never help them. There's an acknowledgement here that Jeremiah has documented in his letter, and now he's saying it again in this lament, and he's saying, when I look on the people of God, they are so wounded, there's no quick fix here. You can't put on some Neosporin and a bandage and hope for the best here. I look on this wound, and it is fatal. And unless there is some sort of invasive work, these people are in trouble. Again, some of the things that we want to do in ministry are very superficial. We just want to keep people happy and keep people coming to church and whatnot. But when we pull back the curtains on what's really going on and we do get our spiritual checkup and we find out how bad it truly is, we can't play church. We can't do these you know, light little attempts to try to better people and and make things just, you know, a little bit improved for them. No, what we recognize is if you were to get your spiritual examination, God will sometimes say, this is a wound from which you will not recover unless something drastic happens. So you have been wounded, the prophet is saying, and he says, here's why. Verse 14, the visions of your prophets were false and worthless. They did not expose your sin to ward off your captivity. The prophecies they gave you were false and misleading. What did they say? Well, you can read about it, Jeremiah 23. He he tells us the, the sort of things that the prophets were saying. The prophets were saying, it's okay, guys. God loves you, and you will experience peace. You don't have to worry about sin. 
You don't have to worry about reforming your life. You don't have to worry about contrition or confession or any of those different things. You don't have to change anything. God loves you. There's peace for you. And God says, those prophets did not sit in my council. What they are communicating to you, they made up out of their own imagination. They were saying peace when, in fact, there is no peace. So Jeremiah here says, here's the problem. The prophets were telling you what you wanted to hear, not what you needed to hear. They did not call out your sin, exposing your sin to ward off your captivity. They did not warn you of the anger of God against sin and the coming judgment. And therefore, on a particular day, that came true for them in a very real and historic way. So Jeremiah is wrecked, and he weeps over this city that lies desolate. And he thinks about the outcome of of this city, and, and he looks at how the enemies are gloating. Look at verse 15. All who pass your way clap their hands at you. They scoff and shake their heads at daughter Jerusalem. Is this, is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty? The joy of the whole earth? The place that has the name of God? A place that bears the, the, the imprint of God himself? A place that, that in other places in the Bible, nations are supposed to look at and go, Is any nation as wise as them to have God so near them as they have their God with them? And here we find out this place that was once known and renowned for its connection with the living God, they look on it and they go, this is it? We torched the place. This is the the joy of the whole earth. We, We laid this place bare. They're scoffing, verse 16, all the enemies open their mouth wide against you. They scoff and gnash their teeth and say, we've swallowed her up. This is the day we've waited for. We have lived to see it. They've conquered the city and now they are gloating over it. And verse 17 tells us this is the fulfillment of what God has planned all along. The Lord has done what he planned. He has fulfilled his word, which he decreed long ago. He's overthrown you without pity. He's let the enemy gloat over you. He has exalted the horn of your foes. Jeremiah laments over his experience. It's interesting, the Bible has a habit of referencing itself. If you read scripture and you pay attention to how there are different uh, quotations that are made or allusions, um, what you find is that it happens all over the place. There are all, all these different cross-references that occur. So 66 different books of the Bible, all these different authors, they have a habit of, of thinking through what have the other people said about this, and they draw that into their own writings and their own conclusions. Lamentations is one of those books where the reference list is quite short. Not a, not a lot of other writers are like, yeah, let's bring that stuff in. But it does show up, and I want to point it out to you because I think this is very, very important. This, what we just read a moment ago, actually shows up in Mark's gospel account. And it's not a direct quotation, it's more of an illusion, but you'll see the connections here in a moment. Mark was writing about the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, as we find out, is a spirit-inspired event, that as they're writing, the Spirit of God is giving words to these biblical authors, but it's not a It's not like he blacked out and wrote the book and came to and was like, whoa, this is awesome. Look what I did. Uh, He he was participating in that process. So you can imagine him writing this down going, okay, what did I see that day? What was going on? Because I watched the Lord of glory get arrested and I watched him march to Calvary and I watched, him, I watched him get crucified there, and I was observing what the crowd was doing and the onlookers and the soldiers and all these different things. How can I describe the significance of this event? And what other references could I offer here that would help people understand what he was performing for us? So he's writing Mark chapter 15, and he's writing this stuff down. And he comes to this point where Jesus is hanging on the cross and he's, he's thinking about, what did I see that day? There were all these punks that would come by and they'd look on him and they would mock him. They would, they would say things about my Lord as he was hanging on that cross. So he picks up this allusion from Lamentations chapter two and he says, those who passed by hurled their insults at him, shaking their heads. And he alludes to Lamentations chapter 2, verse 15. You can look at it. It's in your lap right now. It says, all who pass by, they scoff and shake their heads at daughter Jerusalem. 
these onlookers that were coming by, they were mocking our Lord, and, and it goes on to say, they, they were saying things to him like this, you who said, destroy this temple and you could rebuild it in three days, why don't you come down off of this cross and save yourself? You can't even save yourself. And they mocked him and they ridiculed him. So Mark is writing and he's saying, the judgment of God that the city of God experienced in 587 BC, the judgment of God was visited on the Lord of glory. As he hung on that cross, the Lord experienced the righteous anger of God against sin. He experienced the curse of disobedience and rebellion. And then in verse 17, we got this idea that this is the plan of God. This is what God has planned. Acts chapter 3 picks that idea up as well. Another apostolic author writing about what he, he's thinking about when he thinks about the ministry of the Lord. In Acts chapter 3, he goes, these things happened. The Lord was arrested. He was executed. Pilate was involved with this. You guys were involved with this. But then he makes this comment. And it's in Acts chapter 3, so you can look it up for yourself. But he says, but this was the plan of God. This is the fulfillment of what God has been saying all along. The Lord has done what he planned. He has fulfilled his word, which he decreed long ago. What Lamentations does for us then is it helps us to see that even in the midst of the deepest grief of lament, there is good news. It leads us to the conclusion that the Lord himself took on the consequences of sin. He took on himself the righteous judgment of God. He took on himself at Calvary the curse of law disobedience. He took on himself the wrath of God, and he drank that cup to its fullness. The Lord Jesus Christ exhausted the wrath of God for sin that is due to me and you. Finally, we land on this concept of an invitation to lament, verses 18 to 22. Having described the autopsy of the city, having personally agonized over it, he now invites the city to deal with God. And he invites us to do the same. Cry out to God, verse 18. The hearts of the people cry out to the Lord. You walls of daughter Zion, let your hearts flow like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief, your eyes no rest. Go to God and cry out to him. It's an invitation. It's actually a, a compelling appeal. Please go before the Lord himself and make known the agony of your heart. Cry out to the Lord. Let your tears flow like a river and give yourself no relief. Give your eyes no, no rest. Go to God. Verse 19, arise, cry out in the night as the watches of the night begin. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint from hunger at every street corner. It's saying you need to go before God. He's the only hope that you have. Your wound is incurable. Where else will you go to find the remedy that you need? Cry out to God. Deal with God. The temptation that we have in brokenness is to solve it on our own figure out our own way through it. But God reminds us over and over again, the only way through is to deal with him. So make your request known to him and let them be as raw and honest and unsanitized as the prophet does here. Look at verse 20. Lord, look and consider. Whom have you ever treated like this? Should women eat their offspring? The children they have cared for? Should priests and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? This is an audacious prayer. It's saying, God, how dare you? How can this be okay with you? Have you ever treated anyone like this? I've had two conversations this week of people who are connected to our church who are suffering immensely, and this is the kind of thing that we talk through. There, there is a brokenness that the only appropriate response is to be honest with God and say, I don't get this. I don't understand how you, God, could allow this to happen. And that's what we're being invited to do. Arise and cry out to God and talk to him like this. Don't try to clean up your language. Don't try to make it, you know, sanitary. Be, be real with God because he can handle it. And, and, he, and he deserves to hear the honesty of your heart. Verse 21, it goes on to say, Young and old lie together in the dust of the streets. My young men... And young women have fallen by the sword. You have slain them in the day of your anger. You have slaughtered them without pity. 
As you summon to a feast day, so you've summoned against me terrors on every side. In the day of the Lord's anger, no one escaped or survived. Those I cared for and reared, my enemy has destroyed. It's basically saying, go to God with that sort of brutal honesty that's able to acknowledge how painful it truly is for you. And that's what we must do. Um, A person who did this well in the biblical narrative is the character Job. And his life was a living hell. And what did he do? He went before God with lament, which I didn't know this until we started the series, but lament is actually a word for protest. It's protesting to God. How can this be? And Job goes to God, and you can read his, his book, but over and over again, he's saying to God, how, how is this so in this world that you've made? How, how could it be that I would be treated like this? What have I done to you to deserve this? And the Bible actually gives a couple comments on him, and it tells us that in his protest, in his de- honest dealing with God, and there are things that make us blush. We read it and we go, you can't talk to God like that. But the Bible says in all of that, he did not sin. He, he brought his broken heart before the Lord. He cried out. His tears were flowing before God until there were no more. And the Bible says what he did was right. He did not sin. And at the end of the day, Job didn't get the answer that he wanted. He asked all kinds of questions. He didn't get a very direct and straightforward answer from the Lord, but here's what he got. He did get an answer, and it was enough. And the answer that he got was God. At the end of the day, what Job got was what he most needed, and that is God. And that was enough. And we can go before God and we can cry out and we can lay our hearts bare before him and we can be honest about the hurt and the pain and here's what God says, I will give you myself and that will be enough. So as we come to a conclusion this morning, I want you to recognize a few different things that we've bumped into that we need to be attentive to. The first is that the righteous anger of God against sin is real. It is not a fiction, it is not made up, it is not a hollow threat, it is a reality that we must be attentive to. His anger against sin, though measured and appropriate and carefully calculated, is a very real threat. He hates the things that are destroying us. And if we will not turn to him in repentance and faith, he will pour out his judgment on sin. We also think through the importance of being honest about these things. We don't want spiritual leaders who are going to tell us what we want to hear if that means We're going to okay our sins and experience judgment. We would be better off hearing messages that we don't like, but responding with contrition, confession, and faith. The second thing that we see here is that the experience of suffering is agonizing. It is not something that we take lightly. I would put it like this. Christians are a people who should feel more deeply than anybody else. When we find pain, we don't gloss over it, we enter into it. When we deal with other people who are broken and hurting, we're not trying to quickly, superficially get beyond this. We're actually able to enter in and feel it profoundly. We're not stoics. We're not pretending that everything is okay or stuffing our feelings. I was talking to somebody before service, and they were reminding me of that. That's what we tend to do. We come to church and we pretend, and that's not okay. We need to be a people who are real and can say, this is what I'm dealing with. And unless there is a good God in heaven and a savior who is redeeming me, this is hopeless. So we enter in and we feel deeply, but at the same time, we have a hopefulness that is incredible. We recognize that lament leads us to the good news of the gospel. We recognize that the Punishment of sin, the judgment of God, and the brokenness of this world, that is not a permanent feature. That is a limited reality. And one day, God will do away with that entirely. Jesus took on himself the curse of sin at Calvary. He took on himself the judgment of God. And by doing so, he is redeeming a world gone mad. He is remaking a world in the image of God. He's making all things new. So we come to the end of the Bible, and what do we find? a vision of what that's like. John, the Apostle John, gets a a preview, and he says, I saw something, and it was incredible. I got to tell you about it. This is Revelation 21 and 22. He talks about this reality. He said, I saw the city of God, 
wasn't like this. It wasn't like Jeremiah describes it. I saw the city of God coming down out of heaven from God himself. And I saw and heard some things. Let me tell you about it. He says, there was one who said this. There will be no more tears. And he's wiping away tears. And he says, here's why. There's no more sickness. There's no more cancer situations where you find out the prognosis and you go, okay. There's no, there's no more you know, sickness where your body is failing from the treatment and awful things are happening. He says, that's, that's no more in the age to come. There's no more death. There's no more dying. There's no more, you know, having to attend to funerals and do these different things that are so agonizing for so many of us. There's no more sin. There's no more sickness. There's no more pain. He says, for the old order of things is going away. And the one seated on the throne said, see, I'm making all things new. So we know that as awful as the world can be, as broken as the experience might be for us, we still maintain a hopefulness. And we recognize one day, The hope of glory is going to come true for us. And all the things that we've been through, they will pale in comparison to the glory that will be revealed in us. That allows us to do something incredible. As I said, I think Christians should feel more deeply than anyone else. So we can be honest about the pain while maintaining a hopefulness in in the glory of what Christ has done. One of the authors in the Bible puts it like this, we are sorrowful, full of sorrow, yet always rejoicing. Because we can now look at the world and we can say, it is as bad as you think, maybe even worse than you recognize. But at the same time, we have a Savior, and he is making all things new. This sort of lament leads us into an honest dealing with this world that we live, and it can actually lead us into a worship of our good and gracious God who sent his Son for us. Let's pray right now. Lord, we ask that you would help us to evaluate the brokenness that we're personally experiencing through the grid of your good news. We thank you, Jesus, that you came to suffer and die, that you went to Calvary and you were willing to take on yourself the wrath of God due sin. And that through that incredible cross work, you are accomplishing glory. You are going to make all things new. And in the meantime, Lord, we are waiting with a hopeful expectation of that. But we want to be faithful with the assignment that you've given us. So help us, Lord, to live productively for your glory. Amen.